Welcome to the Good Food CFO Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Delavan, once again, joined by our producer, Chelsea Steer. How you doing, Chels? Sarah, I'm doing excellent. Always happy to be here having these conversations with you. Same. Yeah. On that note, today we are digging into a financial system or workflow, you might call it, that I think probably is not top of mind for most of our listeners, but it's something that can create real efficiency and I think especially like effective communication around the money that is going out of your business. Yeah. We're talking about bill pay systems today. Yeah. And I want to say like if you've gotten this far into the episode and you're like, oh, wait, bill pay systems, like I don't need to use one of those. I'm a solopreneur or my team is so small and I just like manage it all. I want you to stick around. I want you to stick around and just kind of hear me out because if you work with a bookkeeper, if you, you know, want to start growing your team in the future, even if that is just on the financial side of things, like there are things within a bill pay system that can help you with, as you said, communication, organization, streamline, you know, streamlining processes and efficiencies, like even if you're a really small team. And so stick with us. I think you might have your eyes open to, you know, some new ways of thinking about these systems. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I also think anytime you can, as you already stated, right, or as we've already talked about, create efficiencies, improve communication around any part of your business. Ultimately, what you're doing is unlocking untapped potential, yeah. right? And so in that sense, I think it's a super juicy episode. <laughs> That's true. I I, I accept that, uh, you know, insight into it. And I think you're right. Like, even if it is just a system for yourself, and I kind of talk about this in one-on-one -on -one conversations a lot, but even if there's something that only I am managing within like our business at the Good Food CFO, for example, I'll have a system in place for it so that the communication around it is like really streamlined, even for myself. For example, if something can bypass my inbox and go somewhere else, and so I don't need to look at it until I'm ready to look at it, it just like helps to declutter my mind. It helps to declutter my inbox. And so if you're that kind of person who like, you know, seeks that or likes that kind of systems, again, even if you're a solopreneur at this point, yeah, there's a lot to kind of like take away from this. I would even challenge you, Sarah, that even if you're not someone who likes, right, those kinds of things, mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you don't need it. Because I That's think true. that you're dead on when you say like, if it's cluttering your inbox, it's probably cluttering your mind. And so does that, you know, affect the what you are producing even outside of that system, right? Yeah. I mean, one of our first book club books was on this idea of like distraction and and how our, our minds are so busy and how keeping an eye on that inbox or having, you know, Slack messages coming in, just having that happen around you can make it difficult to focus. So if you're able to you know, implement systems and improve that focus, really the benefits of that are exponential and go well beyond just your bill pay process. Yeah, I agree 100%. And maybe in the future, we'll tackle some other financial systems. I'd love that. Awesome. Charles, before we get to the main episode today, I want to talk about a news item as we often do here. And I have to say that the, the news I'm bringing to this episode is not new news. But it is important news and it is relatively new news to me. It's something I've been wanting to share here on the podcast for a little while. We always like to try if we can to, I don't know if people can tell this, but to kind of match a theme right in the news story to the article. And this one didn't really have a great match kind of, you know, to date. And we thought, well, there's nothing in the news about bill pay systems. <laughs> so let's pull this news item that I've been wanting to talk about, you know, out of the parking lot, if you will, and, and onto the episode. And what I want to talk about today is something called restrictive covenants. And we're going to obviously dive into, into that very deeply and, and talk about what that is. But this is a grocery industry news item 
This is something that I think is important for us to know as consumers. And as we like to say, as people who eat, I also think it's important for us inside the industry to know what these practices are. And it's just kind of another way that big retail, big grocery is not serving us and is not, you know, keeping communities, individuals, right, at t- like top of mind and, and focus. What we're going to talk about today is the how they're doing this. It's sort of where do these restrictive covenants come from? Why are they in place? And ultimately, how they have been since the 20s and continue to make access to food difficult for people, especially people of color. Yeah, I am looking forward to digging into this topic. I know that you pulled a couple different stories together yeah. to really make sure that we, not only ourselves, had a full picture of of what has been happening and how it got to this point, but so that we can share that with the audience as well. Yeah. So just to kind of do a little rundown, so some of the articles that we're going to cite today, very likely in our conversation and that are linked to in the show notes are an article from Civil Eats entitled How Leaving Stores Closed for Years Helps Grocery Chains and Hurts Communities. We're linking to a Fast Company article called How Closing Grocery Stores Perpetuates Food Deserts Long After They're Gone, an article from The Counter. And then there's also some information from Supermarket News and the California Law Review. So yeah, we we wanted to read around. We wanted to educate ourselves on sort of the background of this and the foundational information so that we can bring it here. So if you're listening and you're someone who wasn't aware that this was happening, you have that sort of foundational knowledge of of what is going on. And then, you know, we can all sort of keep an eye on this and we can keep you updated, you know, as things hopefully change in this regard. So Sarah, I think we should start with really talking about what is a restrictive covenant. Yeah. So restrictive covenants are provisions written into deeds and lease agreements that govern how a piece of property can or cannot be used for a period of time or in some cases indefinitely. And historically, if you if you read if you read up on this, a lot of what you'll read and and see is that supermarkets historically have sought and received covenants in their leases to protect them from competitors encroaching on their business, either by restricting the size or physical location of competitors, restricting the types of goods and amount of goods that a competitor can sell like in a nearby location, or prohibiting certain retailers, you know, within a, a certain distance of your store altogether. And I think I I imagine like I remember a time where we I was going to open a store. This was back in my, you know, food business ownership days. We were going to open a store and part of the lease agreement was what we're able to sell or what would we would have been able to sell and what we couldn't sell because other types of stores that would carry those products were hopefully going to enter the kind of shopping center, if you will. Mm -hmm. We ended up walking away from the lease because of those restrictions, because it really limited what we could sell and like how much money we'd be able to make. Essentially, we were limited to selling produce only. We couldn't sell meat. We couldn't sell dairy. We couldn't sell cookbooks. We couldn't sell linens. Like It was literally farm stand only, which when we looked at the numbers didn't make sense for us. Mm -hmm. But we understood, okay, well, if you're going to bring a butcher shop in here, it makes sense for us not to be selling meat, right? So while it makes sense on a certain level, as many things within the world of capitalism, they get pushed to their limits. And when we dug further into the information, we found that that's not the whole truth of the origins of the covenants and and it doesn't give the full picture of how we've gotten to where we are today. Yeah, Sarah, and reading through the articles that you shared with me, especially the ones from Civil Eats and The Counter and Fast Company, it, it's really clear that some supermarkets are actually using these covenants to prevent new stores from opening at all mm-hmm. in some communities. And that is creating a long-term lack 
of food access. Yeah. And that I think is the, in, the, the critical thing to know here is that, you know, you can read and try to maybe reconcile, oh, I understand this is a, you know, we're trying to protect businesses so they can be successful. But even if that was true, that that was the reason that you're doing it, the effects are limiting food access for, for large groups of people and where it really gets bad and where it really will get, I think, a lot of people angry is when you look at the resource that we have looked at, one of many, but the California Law Review, because they are shedding light on the fact that in many ways, food deserts, and now called food apartheids, they're not only perpetuated by these covenants, but in fact, they may exist because of these types of covenants in addition to racial covenants. And I'm going to be really honest here and say that I didn't know that racial covenants existed until we were researching this story. Yeah, same. I mean, you brought this to me and it was the first I really had an understanding that this wasn't like an actual practice. Yeah. So in the 1920s and more specifically in 1926, after the Supreme Court case of Corrigan versus Buckley, white people were moving to the suburbs and racial covenants legally prevented black people from doing the same. And looking into the history here, we see that supermarkets followed white families out to the new communities. And as the California Law Review site says, this is a quote here, not content to simply expand into new locations in the suburbs, many supermarket chains abandoned their inner, their inner city stores. And when they sold these locations, many supermarkets imposed what are called scorched earth covenants in their deeds of sale that forbade any future owner from operating or allowing a supermarket at that location. And so that prevented any grocery store from serving the communities that were essentially left behind, forced to stay behind. What you just read there, it makes it very clear that like this was not a practice around making money, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. why wouldn't you expand? Yeah. This was a purely racial action. Yeah. And- the, the really harsh and sad and terrible truth is that it continues to this day. And because these deeds and lease agreements can be decades long, mm -hmm. right, or in infinite in some cases, or if there isn't a deed in place, as we'll kind of talk about, there are other ways that grocery stores are perpetuating food apartheid in in neighborhoods that they don't have any plans on opening a store in, or maybe that their store, you know, is within so many miles and they don't want any competition at all. And so they don't have a, a lease covenant, but they have another tactic to prevent a grocery store from coming to the community. Now, it feels important to say that you and I are not experts in this. We are beginning to learn about this and we're sharing the information that, that we have learned to date. And we both felt that it was important to talk about the racial covenants because it felt that talking about this story without that was omitting part of history that is critical to understanding what is going on here. And we'll continue to, to learn and understand, you know, more and more about it because it's something that I'm highly interested in, in knowing about. And it feels, as I said earlier, important as people who eat and people within the industry who are fighting for access to good food, regardless of where you live, what your demographics are, right? Like, so this is a really, really obviously important topic. If in our community, there is an expert in this, in the historical sense of, you know, what we're talking about with the racial covenants and grocery stores and the lease covenants, like, please point them in our direction. We'd love to have a greater conversation with them about this. We'd, we'd love to hear from them and, 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 like I said, have a conversation with them. The thing we want to talk more about today is how are these covenants continuing today and what are the other ways that 
big grocery is sort of keeping food apartheid in existence through various types of behaviors and practices. One thing that these stories kind of all pointed out, right, is that as grocery stores started to broaden their offerings, so think like how inside, I know maybe Target is not considered, but it's like what's on my mind, inside yeah. Target, there's a Starbucks, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes like with Ralph's too, if you're in California, you're familiar that Ralph's has a Starbucks in it. Yep or a um, flower section or a an eye doctor, mm -hmm. you know, at, like at Walmart, right? You can go to your optometrist. As they started to broaden their offerings, these covenants really evolved and yeah. there were even more restrictions on the types of businesses. Yeah. And, and when we talk about, so there's one thing we're going to dive, you know, continue to dive further into, which is like, like, zero grocery stores for miles on end and the practices that get you there. This is sort of another area where it has detrimental effects to small and local businesses and communities, right? It eliminates options for where to shop, where to buy your flowers, where to get your coffee, right? Because and we're not saying that Target is doing this. I don't have, I don't have the, the, I don't know if that's fact, but suffice it to say, it wouldn't be unrealistic if they said, hey, we're coming in here with a Starbucks and a flower shop and a bank or whatever. And we don't want another one of those in this shopping center, mm -hmm. you know? And so it limits then what can open in those spaces, thus limiting options and choices for the consumer and also for the, you know, the individual perhaps or business that, that is leasing the property. So yeah, another type of negative side effect of these types of covenants. Expanding on what began to happen in the 1920s, where grocery stores leave and no new grocery stores are coming in, there's a myriad of ways that these restrictive covenants extend to after a retailer leaves a location. And I want to talk about a couple of those that were covered in the articles that we're sharing today. So the first was within the counter article, they give an example of stop and shop. So East Coast, sort of like New England chain, it's owned by a Dutch conglomerate. Maybe I'll pronounce this right, a hold Del Hayes. The story here is that in 2012 in Stonington, Connecticut, it refused to sublease a storefront after it relocated. So it still held the lease on the location, but it decided to no longer conduct business there and refused to sublet it. So think for a second. I know this has happened in my hometown. It's happened with a Walmart, um, but it's happened with other stores as well, mm -hmm. that a grocer will leave and that location will remain, remain empty for years. And I think the public thinks, well, that grocer didn't survive. So of course it's going to be hard to lease this location to somebody else, or it's such a big grocery store or XYZ reasons that we think because we don't have that mindset of, oh, the grocer that was here still holds the lease and literally won't let anybody else rent the space yeah. to offer anything to the community, period, right? Fast Company shares a story from 2001 when the local Safeway in Viejo, California, closed and there was no grocery store in that neighborhood for years because Safeway placed a restriction on the deed of the property that said no other supermarket could move in for the next 15 years. And typically that expands to like, if you think of the definition of a supermarket, you can't get around it. Like anything that sells food is going to fall into that category. And this, Sarah, is where I'm really having a hard time, I guess, maybe putting myself in that mindset or understanding because I guess I, and I don't know, the, if I'm a business and I'm moving, I'm, I'm closing down a location, I'm leaving town, who is it hurting if someone else moves in there? Like, how does that hurt me? Why would I want to restrict that? That's I, I can I can almost get my head around why I would want to restrict a florist or a bank, right? At, like if I'm a greedy capitalist and I don't mm -hmm. want anybody else, I want to do it all. Mm -hmm. But in this situation, I, I just it doesn't even make sense to me. 
So interestingly, in 2010, and I just mentioned Walmart, right? But a Walmart representative told, told the Sheboygan Press that, quote, we welcome competition in the marketplace, but what we can't do is provide infrastructure for our competitors in the same market. And the judge found that to be a reasonable argument and of, you know, and, and legally sound. So, I mean, <laughs> what I think is important to point out here is that Walmart has done this repeatedly where they've opened stores for tax breaks or whatever the reasons are that it's beneficial to open a store in one location. Mm -hmm. And then they close that location within certain number of years and move to a not very far away location within the same like city. This happened in my hometown where you've got, you know, in like five or so miles in one direction, you a Walmart opens and a few years later it closes. And then it literally moved like 10 miles from that. Right. But kind of serving essentially the same community mm -hmm. of people. And if there's that original Walmart has remained empty for decades since since I think before I moved out of town. So I was talking to my husband about this because it's it's positioned in like a hill mm -hmm. and there were some rocks that had sort of tumbled down boulders, you know, from the hill. And everyone thought, oh, it's unsafe to be mm. here. It's like under that's not the case. It's a, it, it's got to be a restrictive lease agreement where they don't want anyone to move in there for a long time. And so now they've likely got a restrictive, you know, lease in place at that original location. And now they've got another one in mm -hmm. the location where they're at now. And we've seen a pretty swift erosion of antitrust law and anti-competition law over the last couple of decades. And so I'm not surprised that legally people are siding, you know, with big business here. I shouldn't say people, but but judges and, and the courts are are siding with mm -hmm. big business here. I want to talk about another way that these covenants are used. And this is when a grocery chain remains in a neighborhood yet still has the ability to restrict access to to choices and, and other food outlets. So even if a large chain remains in a neighborhood, it can otherwise ensure that residents miss out on a second piece of the food access puzzle, which is, as I said a moment ago, a choice about where to shop. That's because another way that grocery companies can use restrictive covenants is to buy up nearby land parcels with big enough footprints to support other supermarkets that might come into the neighborhood and claim a share of that grocery pie. And so this keeps other grocers out as long as the company holds on to the property. But even if the company decides to sell, it can then put a deed restriction on that land so that another like, grocery or food outlet can't move in there. And again, stop and shop is used as an example, again, from the counter, because in East Ham, Massachusetts, Stop and Shop purchased 11 acres of land for $1.3 million. Allegedly, this was to keep another supermarket from moving near one of its stores. But here's the kicker. It sold the land back to the town for $1.6 million with a deed restriction that stipulated the community could not use any piece of the property for, quote, a food supermarket, a food superstore, a food warehouse store, a specialty food store, for example, a butcher shop, fish market, fruit and or vegetable market or stand, a wholesale club store operation or a convenience store or for the sale of food or food products for off premises consumption, whether by humans or animals, end quote. And that quote comes from the Provincetown Independent which is a local newspaper there. Yeah. And so what I'm hearing in, in this story is that n not only are we going to corner the market, not only are we going to ensure we have no competition, not only are we going to ensure no one has a choice, mm -hmm. right? We're also going to make an additional profit off of it. Uh -huh. Yeah. And if they decide to leave – 
we've got our, our food apartheid has just expanded mm -hmm. because of the limitations that are in place in this area. Yeah. It's astonishing how much control of land and business and competition and access corporations can have. And obviously it limits the abilities of, of regional and local businesses and brands to succeed. But it just, for me, furthers this need, this mission to get regional and local businesses up and running and profitable so that they can continue to serve the communities. Because I think that something that is very true of good food and mission-based businesses is that they do have the community in mind. They have the environment in mind. They have the humans along the supply chain in mind. And in the long run, it will be so much better for communities. We need support, right? Especially to bring access to underserved or unserved communities. And I know that there are programs, you know, here in LA and, and otherwise where people are converting convenience stores into places with, you know, healthier food options and more re real food options. But like, we have to do so much more. And I, I don't have any answers for that. But kind of going back to why are we talking about this is because we need to get fired up about this reality and realize that the, the humans here, the people are not to blame for their lack of access. They're not to blame for the health repercussions of that lack of access, right? Like we need to do better for our community members. And if step one is understanding the, the truth as best we can about how we got here and how we're going to continue to not only stay here, but actually make the conditions worse. Like, I to me that step one is sort of like be aware, yeah, and 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 then act. And I think that you brought up a really good point around you know regional and local businesses because we've already talked about the legislation piece, right, or the the you know court system and how they're viewing these and how they've historically ruled in some of these cases, right? Yeah. And we can have hope that like that can change. And that's a piece of the puzzle here that needs to change. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about, you know, I think we always like to come back to what can we do? What can you do? What can the listener do? What is the point of having these conversations? I think that you're absolutely right that the big takeaway is around helping to support and create profitable local and regional food businesses and systems. Yeah. And I think part of that, you know, I think a, a little bit of a bright side in this is that some cities have put ordinances in place that ban these types of restrictive covenants. Others have been unsuccessful in putting them in place. So I think, you know, if you're, I think most people listening are in the food industry. It's just the, the nature of our audience. But if you're not for some reason, right. And, and you're asking yourself like, what can I do? I think being aware, mm -hmm. if you have the capacity to be aware of what's going on in your city or your town, if you're able to have a say in whether a piece of land, you know, if, if there's a vote over whether a piece of land gets sold, you know, it's going to be different everywhere. But if we feel so compelled and we want to make a change, another way to do it is, I think, to be as involved as you can in the city that you live in to, to try to help prevent these things from happening in the beginning. You know, in Viejo, California, it took 15 years for another grocery store to arrive. They just had to wait it out you know, and, and that shouldn't mm. be happening. But what that means is that all of the covenants that are currently in place, they're going to, we got to let them live out, which is insane. So the two things that I think can happen are one, prevent it from continuing to happen right mm -hmm. in, into the future and support that the, the local and regional businesses and the creative ways in which we can bring food to people who need it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Sarah. This is um this is a very big <laughs> angering news story on a lot of fronts. We may have gone a little bit longer than we normally do in news stories here. We want your feedback. We want your experiences with this. Again, if you know someone who can speak more 
wisely and informed about the history of both racial covenants and and food access as well as these you know lease covenants that we're talking about here today get them in touch with us. Hello at the goodfoodcfo.com. We're eager to learn. We're eager to share. And we'll keep bringing you stories like this because as I said, knowledge, I think is step one of creating change is knowing why and, and how we got to where we are and, and what has to stop for this issue to not perpetuate long into the future and get worse than it is today. Yeah, that's really well said, Sarah. And Um, We do want to hear from you out there. As you said, if you have anything to add to the conversation, we're we're open ears and open hearts. Yeah. Uh, With that being said, I think let's turn our attention back to the main episode where we're talking about bill pay systems and have some fun with it. So Sarah, today we are going to be talking about bill pay platforms. But before we get into it, I really just want to ask, why are we talking about this? It seems so straightforward. It seems like something, you know, everybody is familiar with bill pay, an automatic bill pay, like in their bank account. And yeah, so I'm just curious, why? I know that bill pay platforms doesn't seem like a juicy topic, but it is. It really is. It's so much more than just a place to go to pay your bills. Third-party bill pay platforms offer organization, efficiency, streamlined communication, which is a big one, especially for a CFO, and also helps to project future cash flow, which you know I'm very much into. So there's so many benefits to bill pay platforms that people just don't realize. And I I want to talk about those and really encourage people to utilize these systems. Okay. So I do have to admit that when you first told me we were doing an episode about bill pay, yeah. I, I did truly think that you meant like paying your bills like from your bank account. So yeah. Can you maybe clarify for me and anybody else what what are these bill pay platforms that you're talking about? Yeah. So some that might be common names for folks are like bill.com, Melio, Settle is a new one that's recently come on to the the CPG, you know, landscape in particular. These are essentially interfaces, right? You know, online tools and apps where all of your bills can be collected and organized. So without a bill pay system, we usually have emails or paper bills that have to be sort of manually organized and we need to kind of keep tabs on. We have to remember their due dates, right? It's a pain in the neck. And food founders out there, I am sure that you are shaking your heads right now in agreement with me that if you had one less thing to think about and that thing was where are my bills and when are they due, it saves a lot of space. And for me, you know, when I was a buyer, part of my job was managing all of the invoices and keeping everything organized. And without a streamlined system, it's kind of annoying if we're being really honest. (laughs) And so bill pay systems help you to collect all of your bills in one place, organize them by vendor, organize them by date, and not have to think about it Mm. so much. You can carve out, you know, a couple minutes of time, let's say once a week, Go to your bill pay platform, pay your bills, and move on with your day. And that has a lot of, you know, big advantages for people. But paying bills isn't the only benefit of using a bill pay system. And in fact, for some of our clients, we use bill pay systems, but we don't actually pay bills through them. So I thought that it could be fun and interesting to dive into the benefits of bill pay systems beyond their primary function and also touch on some of the promises that bill pay platforms make that they can't always keep. Okay. Well, why don't we start right there? You said it, the primary function of these bill pay systems platforms. Yeah. Great idea. So number one is organize your accounts payables, aka your bills, right? When we think about bill pay platforms, they are not all created equally. So as I talk about some of these primary functions and some of the benefits, if you're thinking about, hmm, maybe I want to onboard with a bill pay platform, keep some of these things in mind when you're researching them. So number one, any good 
bill pay platform is going to have an inbox and I'm sort of making air quotes here where your vendors can send your bills so they can mm -hmm. bypass your inbox and go directly to the inbox on the bill pay platform. The benefit there is that you have less clutter in your inbox as a busy founder or CFO or bookkeeper, you name it, right? Also, if you are getting paper bills, which is really common when you're getting ingredients and different things delivered in a food business, you know, you're generally like seeing what you received, checking it off, making sure that it's all there. But now you've got this paper invoice. You can take a photo of it and quickly send it off to the bill pay inbox. Mm -hmm. So then you can kind of forget about it until you sit down to pay your bills. The systems, interestingly, will either use humans who will look at the images of the bills and then transfer the you know necessary information into the bill pay system or they'll use ai and ai is being utilized more and more for this to kind of get that information in there so the things that they're translating for you are you know the vendor the due date of the bill the amount of the bill and the expense account that that bill will go to in your accounting software. So you might be already starting to see how using a bill pay system sort of is helping with the additional organization and communication beyond just paying the bills. Absolutely. A second primary function of bill pay platforms is to actually streamline the process of paying bills. So as I've been kind of saying, all of your bills are in one spot, right? And then you can organize them by due date or by vendor and select what you want to pay today or in the future. So imagine, again, having all of your bills in one spot, they're all organized and verified. And now you can sit down and say, okay, these bills are due in the next seven days. I'm going to check a couple of boxes and get those paid. By the way, this next set of bills is due in 14 days, let's say, and I can, while I'm sitting here, if I can see, you know, my cash flow is available for me to pay these, schedule them to come out of my account a week from now. Mm. So you don't have to even sit down every single week to do this work, depending on what your, you know, your systems and things are in your business. One of the great features of bill pay systems is the ability for them to recognize if a bill has already been added to the system and is a duplicate. Uh. You know, I was a food sourcing manager for several years in my in my work. It can be so frustrating to go, wait a second, did I already pay this invoice? I feel like I already paid this invoice. Now you've got to go into your payment system. You've got to see if you've paid it, or maybe you need to go into your checking account and see if you paid it. You have to look at the statement, right? The new kind of bill pay systems have a the ability to, when you upload a bill, to say to you, hey, this looks like a duplicate of bill with the exact same number for the exact same vendor. You know, you don't need to upload this again. And it's like, thank you very much. And you can just archive that bill and move on with your day. So it's got these capabilities that kind of save you what seems like not a ton of time, but in the grand scheme of paying bills, like week after week after week, it really, really adds up. And again, it's just like one less thing to think about. And not just time. I would even say, uh, you know, the the hassle, right? Mm -hmm. Of what if you do accidentally pay that bill yeah. a second time? And now you got to figure out, you either got to cancel the payment or you got to get the money back or you got to whatever, whatever that looks like. Yeah. Now you've That's got a credit additional. on your account. Yeah, you've yeah. got a credit on your account. Now, okay, they, there's a certain way that certain vendors require you to do things to get that credit. Yeah, it's, yeah, it, it is. It's like it's it removes like an annoyance. Yeah. And then the other thing, and this is relatively new with like the, the kind of like current wave of bill pay systems is you can pay multiple bills for one vendor at the same time. Mm. So this is another kind of efficiency step here. It also has the ability to save you a little bit of money, which I can get into a little bit, you know, further on in this episode. But imagine you work with the same vendor week in and week out. Now you've got four invoices a month. They all have relatively the same due dates, like within a couple of days of each other. Old fashioned way, even if you're doing it electronically, is that you have to pay each of those invoices separately. So it's four steps to pay four invoices. If you've got all four invoices in the bill pay system, you can select all four bills and make one payment for all of those, you know, bills that you have. And they'll be reported to your vendor saying, this is one payment and it's paying all four of these bills and we are good to go. So it saves just time in like transactionally as you're paying a bill. 
but also the way that some bill pay systems work. And again, we'll kind of talk about this more in detail a little later on, but you pay by the payment. So for example, if you make one ACH payment, it'll cost you like 40 cents, right? If you make four ACH payments, it's $1.60. The ability to make four invoice payments in one and have that only cost you 40 cents to process the payment is also a cost savings as well. So it's kind of dual benefits to being able to do Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Now, Sarah, at the at the beginning of this episode, you mentioned that there's also some promises that these bill systems maybe can't always keep. Yeah. Let's get into that. Yeah, I think the biggest one is that a lot of these platforms market themselves as being cash flow management tools. And I think that's just incorrect. I have not met a bill pay system at the time of this recording that truly allows you to create or to to have accurate cash flow projections. The reason that this is is because not 100% of your bills are going to go through the bill pay platform. Think about it. You have, you know, invoices and bills that you're paying regularly, but you also might have things that are on auto pay, right? Like your Adobe subscription might be on auto pay. Your Clavio subscription is on auto pay, right? There are all of these sort of operational subscriptions that are on auto pay and might be automatically coming out of your bank account on specific days of the month. Then you've got your bills, and I keep using the term invoice and bill kind of interchangeably in this conversation, but you've got your bills in the bill pay platform and those are being tracked. Because your auto pay is not flowing through the bill pay system, it is not getting included in the cash flow projection. And so it's simply not a reliable cash flow management tool. Mm-hmm. I do think, and and you know, in having conversations with different bill pay platforms and their customer service teams, this is something that they're working on where your cash flow, you know, will be complete and can include payments you're making outside of the platform, but we haven't seen that come to fruition yet anywhere. So that's a big kind of um, promise that bill pay systems to date have not been able to to keep and really like stand up to. Mm -hmm. The other one, and this is more minor, but so within bill pay systems, you can pay via ACH. You also have the opportunity to pay via like what they call fast ACH. So I think that's like next day generally as compared to say like three to five days for a regular ACH payment. And then you have good old paper checks. And so if you're working with a vendor that doesn't accept ACH payments and you need to send them a paper check, you can do it the old school way, write it out by hand, put a stamp on it, put it in the mail, or you can use the bill pay system to send a paper check. These are not fast. These are in fact very, very slow. I have yet to encounter like a check payment option where the vendor hasn't called and been like, hey, where's my check? I saw that the payment was, you know, processed on such and such date and it like still hasn't reached us yet. So I think the expectation that this is going to be quick because you're doing it through your platform is sort of an unrealistic expectation. It's also more expensive. We're talking about ACH payments costing 30, 40 cents per transaction in some cases, Checks are anywhere between like 2 and $3 at the time of this recording to mm. send it. So I think it's also a high price to pay to have a paper check sent. Um, so I, I kind of lean old school when it comes to, to this type of payment. And when you say old school, you just mean sitting down and writing the check out yourself. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Well, I know that you also mentioned at the top that there were some benefits beyond just paying the bills that we might not see yet. Yeah. But I'd love for you to share those with us. Yeah. So I'm going to try to narrow it down here for us into the different people on the team that can benefit and be Mm -hmm. communicated with through the bill pay system. So one of them is definitely going to be your bookkeeper. The other one is definitely going to be your CFO if you have one. And the third is a group that I'm going to call the leadership team. So anybody in your organization who maybe has the ability to approve purchases, right? And maybe receiving invoices or even making payments on invoices, right? Mm-hmm. So let's start with the leadership team, that that group. So as I said, people across your organization, if you have a team, 
may be capable of approving purchases and receiving bills that they can then send directly to the bill pay inbox, which frees up their inbox. It also frees up you know, the founder's inbox. If you've got an executive assistant or an accounts payable team, right? Their inbox also is just going to be free of these emails, which like, hey, I made this purchase and here's the invoice, right? And now you've got to keep track of all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So when your team has the ability to approve purchases and then you've got the infrastructure in place where that invoice can simply be forwarded to the bill pay inbox, it just streamlines that process of getting your invoices to one central place. It also helps to communicate with whomever is responsible for paying the bills. They can, they got that bill, it's in hand, and they're able to just make a decision on when to pay it. I'm a huge fan of minimizing what hits your inbox and having systems for just being like, okay, when I'm ready to pay bills, we're going to go to the bill pay place and do that. Right. So I think, you know, oftentimes, and I've seen this in organizations that I've worked with, you know, the, the operations lead is like placing orders for packaging and for labels and for different things. And they're getting the invoices and then they're getting emails about payment and, and they're asking if it's okay to pay or they're paying bills and you don't know. And suddenly there's hundreds or thousands of dollars missing from the bank account that you weren't planning for, right? It also eliminates that from happening in your company. It essentially, I think, creates the ability for one person to easily be responsible for organizing and paying all of the bills, which I think has great benefit. The next group is bookkeepers, as I mentioned. And so this, I think, may be self-explanatory, but bill pay systems are a great place to communicate details of the bills you're paying so that they're entered into the accounting system correctly. So here's an example of, of why this matters and why I love bill pay systems as a communication tool for bookkeepers. You might have an invoice, a bill, where you bought a bunch of stuff. And everything you bought on that bill is like a different category of expense. So you might have ingredients, you might have packaging, you might have janitorial supplies, all coming from the same vendor. But the way that you're tracking your expenses in your financials is such that you are trying to track your ingredient expenses separate from your packaging expenses, separate from your job supplies. And the old school way of communicating is to hand write on a bill what each thing is for and then like scanning or getting that bill to your bookkeeper, right? In today's day and age, lots of bookkeeping teams have the bank accounts just linked to QuickBooks or whatever accounting software you're using and they actually don't see any detail and may not even see any invoices. So when you implement a bill pay system, you can upload an image of the bill with either the handwritten detail on it or what I like even better is you have the ability to say, okay, my total for ingredients on this bill was $100. My total for packaging on this bill was $200. My total for janitorial expenses was $75. And even if you're not paying your bill through that bill pay system and you're paying it another way, your bookkeeping team has visibility on how a particular bill should be separated so that your expenses are categorized correctly. Yeah, that's huge. Another like little thing, but that I think saves a lot of time in the long run is when the way a bill like or like a charge hits your bank account doesn't match the actual vendor name. So I'm just going to make something up. Let's say we've got a company out here called California Linens. And everyone knows California Linens, that's linens. But suddenly the bank, you know, when you look at the bank, it's not saying California Linens. It's got the parent company name, mm. you know, Laundry Services Inc. And you're like, who's Laundry Services Inc.? Like, okay, I know that that's laundry, but like, is it this bill that we got from California Linen or is it not, right? So you can go into the bill pay system and say, okay, hey, we had this bill for $49.50 this week and it's, you know, Laundry Services Inc. I'm not familiar with them. You can pop into the bill pay system and see, oh, it is indeed California Linen. I can, I, I understand how to reconcile this. Now, in that instance, I gave 
it was pretty easy to, to realize that that was a linen company, but oftentimes it'll just be like random name LLC and you won't know how to categorize it like simply based on the name. Um, yeah. It also helps to prevent duplications, right? You might have, oh, we made a payment to California Linen. Oh, also there's this Laundry Services Inc. Now you've got two expenses that are actually the same expense on your books and this can help avoid that as well. Nice. So the last persons in your company that having a bill pay system can help communicate with is the CFO. So oftentimes the CFO is responsible or oversees cash flow management, especially if they also take on the controller role, which we do for a number of our clients. And so when bills are uploaded to a bill pay system, they've got net 10, net 15, net 30, you know, whatever the terms are, the CFO is able to see those bills. And now they know what expenses are coming up in the future and they can take that information and put it into the cash flow projector. I mean, we did an entire episode on cash flow and how valuable I think it is to utilize the simple cash flow projection spreadsheet that I literally use daily for all of my clients. When I say that bill pay streamlines communication, it is very true that we have clients that don't pay their bills via bill pay. And the reasons are often because they can pay from for free from their checking account. Mm. So they don't need to incur a fee, right, to use a bill pay system. Maybe they're fine with going to the vendor website and paying that way. But what the bill pay system does is, A, again, allows me to see what bills do we have coming up. It allows me to schedule them in the cash flow, you know, projection. So we know, okay, what's coming up? What does our projected bank balance look like, you know, into the future? And the other thing it does, especially if, you know, someone like me is in that controller role, what we're essentially doing is saying, I've got my eye on cash flow. These are the bills that you can pay this week. And so we'll either push them to the founder for payment within the cash flow system and they'll pay it right from there or we'll push them to the founder through the system and then they'll go to their preferred way of paying the bill pay it that way and then just mark it paid in the bill pay system so not only do i have eyes on everything that is due today and in the future right as far as we can up to 30 days usually we also know if the payment has been processed or not and how it was paid and then we also have a record of bills we've paid and bills that are still outstanding. And this benefit really applies to founders as well, right? So if you've got all of your bills in one spot and you're using the cash flow projector, it immediately becomes easier for you to use the system to quickly project your future expenses. And then it also becomes really easy for you to see, okay, here are the bills that I'm able to pay this week. And then you can just go and pay them, you know, in your preferred system. So it's kind of doubles up as a great way of communicating, but also a great way of streamlining, you know, multiple parts of the process of making sure you're managing your cash well. Yeah. That was the first place that my mind went when you started talking about the benefits for the CFO and the communication was I was like, oh yeah, when you have so many different bills on all these different terms or invoices, right? On all mm -hmm. these different terms, just having a place to organize that and to be able to see into the future, that's huge. <laughs> yeah. On the on the topic of cash flow management, I think too, you know, if we're thinking about a business that doesn't have a lot of cash or maybe that has had to outlay a lot of cash and now things are really tight in their business, having the bills organized and being able to project them out on the cash flow projector shows you both when you can pay a bill, but also when you can't pay a bill. And if you're approaching a time where, oh shoot, we need to increase our revenue to cover this, or we need to get some outside funding to cover some of these upcoming expenses. I think that, you know, for me, I wouldn't be able to do cash flow management effectively without bill pay systems and platforms. Yeah. I think that's so great. So <laughs> My next question, Sarah, is if you have a favorite, do you have a favorite bill pay system? I was afraid you were going to ask this question. Um, I hate to play favorites and to say 
like this is the one that I recommend because I think it's important for every founder to do a bit of research and find the system that works best for them. Also, because things change over time, I could say what my favorite is today and a new better tool could come, you know, around in the future. This is another reason I kind of hesitate to just kind of lay it out there. But if you want to email hello at the good food CFO, Dot com, I and you ask, I will share it with you there. Sort of real time recommendation. I will yeah. do that. So is that fair? Okay, that is fair. I okay. but I will ask you this: if you were choosing a bill pay system today, yeah, what are some of just the general things that people should be paying attention to, or might want to consider? how that system fits into their business? Yeah, that's a great question and that I'm happy to answer. So number one, I think that simple thing of having a bill pay inbox is going to be a crucial part of the system really helping to create efficiencies and streamlining and organizing you know, all of these documents that you may have. Mm-hmm. The other thing is poke around and and look at the layout of the platforms. I will say that there is like a platform or two that I just I get overwhelmed by. There's just Mm. so much information. The font is really tiny. The way I navigate around it, it just doesn't work for me and the way that my brain thinks. And so I tend to gravitate toward other bill pay platforms than those just based on the layout. So I think go and, and take a free trial, you know, look at the layout, things of that nature. The other one, and this is a really big one, just as important as the, the layout. And if it works for you know, your brain and kind of how things function there is the fees. I am not a fan of platforms that charge a flat monthly fee. So at the time of this recording, there's typically two ways that a bill paid platform will make money, right? One is a flat fee, $30 a month, $45 a month, right? And there's going to be a certain amount of ACH payments or check payments that are included in the level of service that you choose. And if you go beyond that, then there's usually like incremental fees, like based on like on a per payment, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, basis. The other type of bill pay platforms don't have a flat monthly fee and you will pay a small fee for every transaction that you process on the platform. So for example, we use one system where ACH payments are 40 cents each and checks are $2 each. Compared to a platform that is a $45 flat monthly fee, I would have to send 113 ACH payments to hit that $45 mark. If I'm not going to pay 115 or more, I'm not going with that flat fee system because I simply don't need to spend that much money. I've got companies that I work with who pay $6 a month on the high end, $12 a month, you know, based on the number of actual ACH payments that they're processing on a monthly basis. So I think when you are, you know, looking at the layout, when you're looking at the functionality of it, also look at how many bills are you going to be paying and make sure that the fee structure works to your benefit Mm -hmm. and that you're not overpaying for the system. You know, Sarah, when we started this conversation, you said that people might not think that talking about bill payment systems is, is juicy, but that you would show them where the juice was. Right. (laughs) And I do think that you've done that here because at the end of the day, anything that saves you time, energy, hassle, right? That allows you to stay organized and eliminates Mm -hmm. or reduces human error. All of that equals more money in the bank account. Yeah. And here's something else that I didn't mention, Chelsea, is that I love a bill pay system that has approval functionality or approver functionality. Mm -hmm. And when you said efficiency just then, it, it, it made me recall this. When you have systems, you are able to hand off work, right? Hand off processes to someone else. With a bill pay system, founders are able to hand off cash flow management and bill pay to me. You can also hand that off to someone inside of your organization, but at, at, and still maintain the final approval and the final like sending of 
a payment, right? So another huge benefit of this, if it wasn't abundantly clear by some of the benefits that we've talked about, is that you can hand this process off to someone else, mm -hmm. right? But still be the person who says, yes, I am paying this bill, right? So you can have someone on your team organizing the information for you, verifying that the vendors are correct, verifying that the amounts are correct, verifying that we've got the money in the bank, or maybe they don't do that part. Maybe they just send you through the system. These are the bills that are due this week. And you're responsible for looking at the cash flow and saying, okay, these are the ones we're going to pay. And I'm going to hold off on, you know, on these few, right? It also helps to see are all of the bills that my company is receiving like accurate. Mm -hmm. We've had instances where the accounts payable team gets an invoice. This is a real example. It was for over $14,000. It was close to $20,000 from a vendor who typically charges, you know, their bills are like around $2,000 whenever mm -hmm. they send one in. And so this was like a big red flag. And it's like, hey, this is a lot higher than normal. We we're able to push that to the CEO and go, hey, did you have a conversation with this person where you approved this really big expense? And the answer was no. So it also helps to go, oh, hey, here's something that's very different than what we've seen before. I can quickly and easily communicate this to the person who would be in the know and then have them kind of get to the bottom of why this invoice looks this way, right? So just being able to, for lack of a better term, offload the responsibility to someone else and to give the you know give that responsibility to someone on your team it just allows you to focus on the things that are the best place for you to spend your time yeah. within your company well sarah thank you so much for sharing all of this information and i will point out to our listeners again that she did offer to have a conversation with you about bill pay systems by emailing us at hello at the goodfoodcfo.com. But Sarah, I also want to call out a couple of tools that we have that I think could be really helpful in this conversation as well, or one tool really in particular, which is our cash flow projector. It's one of our highest selling tools that we yeah. have. People really love the simplicity in inside that tool and that calculator. And I think that combining a bill pay system with, as you said, cash flow management, that's a great tool that people could use to do that. Yeah, I think that's a great, great tool to point out. So if you are interested in learning more about our cash flow projector, you can do so by visiting our website, thegoodfoodcfo.com and clicking on courses. But a little behind the scenes info, that actually might change in the near future. We are doing some behind the scenes work on our website and we're not exactly sure where the the courses and the tools are going to be living yet or what they'll be called, but they'll be there. And you can also always just Google the Good Food CFO cash flow projector. That'll take you right to it. <laughs> yeah. Or email us again, like hello at the goodfoodcfo.com. That's your direct line to us, not only to ask about my favorite bill pay systems, but also to, you know, get a link, a direct link to a tool you might be looking for to share ideas for future episodes. We are still open to that idea, guys. So reply to the weekly newsletter. If you're on that list, sign up if you're not and just send an email. Let us know what you're thinking about the show, ideas you have, anything like that. We love Love to hear from you guys. So yeah, there's literally nothing that energizes us more than hearing from you guys and what's on your mind. Yeah. All right, Sarah. Well, thanks so much again for sharing today and uh, I'll see you next week. Sounds good. See you then. Looking for more content like this, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll see weekly podcast episodes as well as other content related to the show. Just visit youtube.com forward slash at the good food CFO. Thank you for joining us here today. If you enjoyed this episode or found it helpful or inspiring in any way, please share it with your founder friends on social and rate and review the podcast wherever you listen. It's the number one way to help good food founders find the show. We'll be back with a brand new episode next week.